Welcome back, students. In the next two lectures, we will discuss transport phenomena. In other words, we will study the movement of matter and energy in systems to reach equilibrium when they are taken outside of equilibrium. We'll start today with the most straightforward, that is the mass transport, otherwise known as diffusion. In the next lecture, we will briefly investigate other transport properties such as thermal conductivity, viscosity, and ionic conductivity. The learning goals for today are going to be to define flux and also diffusion, how diffusion works. We're going to explain the micromolecular origins of diffusion, so what actually is the root cause for diffusion. And then we're going to be, want to be able to calculate the distance particles travel with respect to time to get an idea of how far particles will actually diffuse. In order for there to be a net transport of any property, the system must be out of equilibrium. In the case of diffusion, the distribution of molecules must be uneven across the system. Imagine such a system. What do you expect to happen? The system will soon reach equilibrium where the number of particles is evenly distributed. A central concept in transport phenomena is the flux which is defined as the quantity transferred through a given area per time. You can see here a flux in an example of diffusion. Flux only occurs when there is an imbalance, otherwise the net flux will be zero. So the flux can be described as the number of particles moving through this plane or time. Since there are more particles on the left side than the right side, there will be more particles moving from the left to the right in a net flux. Note that this flux also opposes the number density. So the number density is highest on the left and the flux goes from the left to the right because the flux is restoring equilibrium. In the case of diffusion, the flux is simply the number of particles that pass through this area. We have to consider the flux in both directions and add them together. A generic definition of flux can be seen here. The symbol we use for flux is often J, and this is a directional flux, so we have flux in the X direction. Flux is equal to some constant alpha, and the alpha constant is going to be different depending on the property at hand. Uh, for diffusion, it will simply be the diffusion coefficient. We'll see how we derive that here in the next few minutes. Um, so it's alpha times the derivative of some property with respect to x. So this reflects the imbalance in our property. So for example, if the number density is our property and that was even, there would be no change in number density with respect to position. So d, dn, dx would be zero and there would be no flux. However, if there is some change, there is going to be uh, some flux. And the negative sign here denotes the fact that the flux is opposing the number density. So the flux is negative if the gradient in the number density is positive and vice versa. We will derive the laws for mass transport or diffusion here today, and then on the next lecture we'll look into the other types of transport that we mentioned above. We'll first think about how particles diffuse in response to a concentration gradient. We know from previous discussions of thermodynamics that a concentration gradient would create a gradient of chemical potential and that chemicals flow from high chemical potential to low chemical potential. So we'll start today and describe the diffusion of ideal gases and then in the next lecture we'll begin by looking at diffusion in solution. Consider the concentration gradient shown here centered around x equals zero. There is a gradient in number density where there's more particles on the left side than the right side. We can calculate the flux through this plane of x equals zero. To investigate diffusion, we need to calculate how many particles are moving from the left to the right side and then how many particles are moving from the right to the left side. To know that, we need to know how many particles there are. And for this, we use uh, the following equation. So we're gonna evaluate the number density at negative lambda. 
Recall from the last lecture that lambda is simply the mean free path, which is the average distance a particle moves before colliding. When choosing this distance, that means that all the particles in this region will move one free path before colliding and changing directions and actually cross the flux plane. The same is true for the opposite direction. So all the particles moving from here uh, in this direction will also cross the flux plane. We can determine the number density at any point using this equation here. This equation is a Taylor series expansion around the point x equals zero, but really what it is, it's just using rise over run like you would have done in your first algebra class. The number density at uh, uh, and lambda is simply equal to the number density at zero minus lambda, the distance we traveled, times the slope. Um, so that's all that we're doing to get these different number densities. And of course, the same is true for positive lambda. So in this case, we have used only the first two terms of the Taylor series which is assuming that the concentration gradient is slight and we can approximate the concentration gradient with a simple linear slope. If the concentration gradient is more extreme, you would need to use more terms in the Taylor series expansion. But again, consider how likely is it that we actually have a very extreme difference in particle density. It's pretty unlikely for most scenarios. We expect to be very near equilibrium. We can view diffusion in a very similar process to effusion that we saw in the last chapter. So let's go ahead and go to the board and start doing some calculations. The movement of particles across the flux plane is simply going to be the concentration of particles multiplied by the average velocity and the area of the flux plane. So what we can do is say that dn dt, the rate in change of our number of particles, is equal to the flux in the x direction multiplied by the area of the flux plane. And we can then define the flux in the x direction as, like we said above, the number density times the average velocity. So just like for a fusion, we're considering velocity in one direction, and we're only considering positive velocity since particles moving in the negative direction will not reach the flux plane. So we can go ahead and evaluate this integral. We've done this before. The integral ends up being one fourth times the average velocity. So this gives us a flux of the number density over four times the average velocity of the particles. We can then determine the net flux by adding the individual fluxes in both directions. So flux in the negative direction, going from negative lambda to zero, would be one fourth times the average velocity times the number density at point lambda, which gives us one fourth times the average velocity. And then our Taylor series expansion for the number density at negative lambda was the number density at zero minus lambda times the slope. So dn dx. We can do the same thing for positive lambda. So the flux at positive lambda is going to be one fourth times the average velocity times the number density at positive lambda, which is equal to one fourth times the average velocity times the number density at zero plus the mean free path times the slope of the concentration gradient with respect to position. To consider the net flux, we simply have to add these two together. Now, we actually, it turns out we're not going to add them because particles moving from negative lambda to zero are moving in one direction, but particles moving from lambda to zero are moving in the opposite direction. So we actually have to subtract these two fluxes to get the net flux. So what that's going to give us is going to be one fourth times the average velocity. Now, if we end up subtracting these two guys from each other, what we'll note is that this number density at zero cancels. And so what we're gonna be left with is negative two lambda times the slope of our change in number density with respect to position. So putting that all together, we'll have a negative one half times the average velocity times the mean free path, times the change in number density with respect 
to position. Now this, we're not quite done here. So before we are done, we have to introduce one more correction. Particles that are moving are moving in all directions. That means that some proportion of the particles that are one mean free path away, if we go back and draw our example here where we have x equals zero and x equals negative lambda, if we have a particle at negative lambda, it will move one mean free path and cross the flux plane. However, our particles are not limited to x directional motion. So we could have a particle very near uh, lambda that moves one mean free path and does not actually cross the flux plane in our given time. The way to uh, properly account for this and figure out how many particles actually cross the flux plane is fairly involved. Um, what we're going to do is state the result from this. This is using um, just basic math here to say that two thirds of the particles that are one mean free path away actually cross the flux plane. And so what we have to do then is simply multiply our net flux by two thirds. So our net flux becomes two thirds times minus one half times the average velocity times the mean free path times the change in number density with respect to x. And so plugging in two thirds there, we simply get minus one third. So one third average velocity times the mean free path times the change in number density with respect to x. Now, look at what we've got here. What we have is a change in a property with respect to position multiplied by some negative constant. And this is our generic definition of flux. So what we can do is say that these constants here are equal to alpha. And for diffusion, the coefficient we use actually gets a capital D and is the diffusion coefficient. So this diffusion coefficient we can say is equal to one third times the average velocity of the particles times the mean free path of the particles. And this is the diffusion coefficient. This relationship is known as Fick's first law of diffusion. Note that diffusion depends on the average velocity and the mean free path. So all the conclusions we drew from the kinetic theory of gas uh, model holds here. Uh, the namely being that large particles will have a lower average velocity and will move slower and will diffuse through space slower. Another interesting application of diffusion comes when we look at how particles move in time. If we have a concentration gradient, the net flux will eventually remove this gradient. How fast will this happen? Or how fast will particles actually move? To answer these questions, we can consider flux through a further flux plane. So to go ahead and draw this in here, we have our flux plane at zero and we have particles moving in from some region, they're moving this way. And we wanna know, well, what's the likelihood that they continue moving and actually move through a second flux plane? And so we can define this as the flux through x plus dx, where this dx is the distance between our first flux plane and our second flux plane. And we know that the flux is equal to the negative diffusion coefficient times the change in number density with respect to x. In this case, our number density is going from x plus dx. We can use a Taylor series expansion to estimate the particle density at x plus dx like we've done before. So d times the number density of x plus dx is simply going to be equal to the number density at position x and then plus dx times the slope of the number density distribution. Plugging this into the previous equation, we get the following. We have that our flux is equal to negative d times d dx of the number density at point x plus dx times the slope of the change in number density with respect 
to x. So evaluating this, we're going to actually have a second derivative here. So what this gives us is negative d times the derivative of the number density with respect to x, plus now the second derivative of the number density with respect to x. And then we have a dx here. With this equation, we can now investigate how particles actually move in time. The time evolution of particles across these two flux planes is dependent on the difference in the number density at each flux plane. If the concentrations at each, at each flux plane were equal, there would be no net flux. We can therefore relate the change in concentration with respect to time to the change in concentration with respect to distance in what is known as Fick's second law of diffusion. So what, uh, in math terms, what I just said is that the partial derivative of our number density with respect to position in time, with respect to time, is equal to the partial derivative of the flux at point x minus the flux at point x plus dx with respect to position. So evaluating this, this is the partial derivative with respect to x of our equation up here of minus d times the partial derivative of uh, number density with respect to position in time with respect to x. This is the, the normal flux. And then we also have our second term from our flux at the further flux plane, which is minus, minus d times the partial derivative of n of position in time with respect to x plus d partial derivative of n x and t with respect to x squared dx. And so with this, you can see that what we're going to end up getting is the cancellation of these two terms here. So Fick's second law of diffusion says that the change in uh, uh, number density with respect to time is equal to the negative diffusion coefficient times the second derivative of number density with respect to position. I'm going through and uh, solving this equation here. This differential equation can be solved. We won't go through the solution of this differential equation, but the answer is the equation that fits this is that our number density with respect to position and time is equal to the original number. So we have some number of molecules at the starting plane divided by 2a, where a is the area of the flux plane we're moving through times the square root of pi times the diffusion coefficient times time is equal to e to the minus x squared over 4dt. We can see the equation that we just derived here. In this equation, n naught is the initial number of particles confined to a plane of area A, d is the diffusion coefficient, and x is the distance away from the starting plane, and the lowercase t is time. We can determine the RMS displacement, which is often used as a benchmark value to talk about how far the particles have diffused. Uh, we've seen this calculation for the RMS displacement before, and th this value represents the distance that approximately 68% of the particles have moved. So by evaluating this integral for the root mean squared displacement, we end up with the following expression, that the root mean squared displacement is the square root of two times the diffusion coefficient times time. So if we know the diffusion coefficient for a particle, we can simply plug in the time, be it one second, one minute, one hour, and this will tell us approximately how far 68% of the particles have actually moved away from the starting point. Now we'll talk about estimations for diffusion coefficient in the next lecture. This is specifically for one-dimensional diffusion. So for three-dimensional diffusion, we can use the Pythagorean theorem, uh, assuming that any uh, 
diffusion in any dimension is equally likely to obtain uh, basically two times three for three dimensions. So the RMS displacement for three dimensional diffusions is the square root of six times dt. And we can see that what's happening with diffusion are these Gaussian uh, functions. As time increases, the particles are more spread out. So they're always most likely to be at zero, but they spread out and become uh, more likely to be further away as time increases. Note in all of this discussion of diffusion that diffusion is inherently a random process. So diffusion acts because molecules are moving in a direction and they change direction when they collide with another uh, molecule. We discussed this in the last lecture, but collisions are happening all the time. So the fact that there's so many collisions means that it's actually pretty challenging for a molecule to get any coherent motion in one direction. That's why the, the greatest probability for particles is always to be at their source, because it's most likely that they're going to end up right back where they started by reversing direction. However, over time, we get many particles moving a substantial distance away uh, from the start. In the next lecture, we're going to discuss diffusion in solution, which is pretty similar to diffusion uh, in uh, vacuum or in air. Um, and then we'll also look at these other types of diffusions that we mentioned earlier.